In conceptual section two, we are beginning to talk about power curves. In the previous simulations, we were effectively simulating the null hypothesis that there is no effective experimental manipulation and that the scores from both groups were essentially being sampled from the very same distribution. The other possibility is that the experimental manipulation was effective and it did cause a difference, some kind of difference between the groups. And in this case, uh, we expect that the measurements from each group are coming from different distributions. I mean, um, effectively, we're assuming that some causal force from the manipulation changes performance in such a way that there are systemic changes to the scores in the group that received the manipulation. And I'll note that the experimental manipulation could in principle change almost any property of the distribution. Uh, today we'll talk about differences in the means. This is often a focus of research interest when you run an experiment and you might wanna see if you caused a mean difference in the scores that you were measuring. So effectively, we're going to be asking questions like, what proportion of experiments would be significant if, and then there's kind of a dot, dot, dot here. We're going to use the tradition of setting an alpha value to make some claim about the null hypothesis. And just for fun, we'll set it at P less than 0.05. First of all, let's be confident in our ability to answer a basic question. So if we set alpha P less than 0.05, what proportion of experiments will be significant according to the null hypothesis? That is, remember, there's no difference between groups. So we've set up some code, flip over to R. Here we're going to run the experiment we've been simulating and let's run it, uh, oh, I had a five here. So I think we have to go back to two. So two scores per person, 10 people per group. Uh, oh, this is actually all a little bit different. Let's keep it at five, sorry. And in, in this new example, note that I've just set the mean to zero and the standard deviation to one. So we're, we're looking at a unit normal distribution here, but as we know from previous lectures, the normal distribution has the same shape in terms of its uh, overall form and the probabilities of getting values between standard deviation ranges. So the main things to focus on is we have 10 subjects per group, five scores per subject. We're calculating the mean for each subject. Then we're doing a t-test between these two groups to ask the question, is the mean different? Is there a difference between the means? There shouldn't be one because there is uh, no difference between the uh, population that we're sampling from. In this case, we're assuming no difference, so we're sampling from the same population. And we're going to do this 1,000 times like we've been doing before. However, this time we're going to save the p-values. So it's like looking at um, 1,000 attempts to run an experiment that doesn't work. Every time we will get a t-value and a p-value associated with that t-value. So let's do that. And let's look at the histogram of those p-values. Here it is. It's roughly a uniform distribution, as it should be. And we see that, that and so what, just to comment on this a little bit further, across the 1,000 different experiments, we found p-values from zero all the way to one with roughly equal probability in between. So out of a thousand, how many would be less than 0.05? 
by definition, it should be about 5%. So we can see that here. And then this time we got bang on the money 5% um, of our simulations had a p-value less than 0.05. So we can move from there to considering a situation where the experiment did work. So for example, what proportion of experiments would be significant if there actually was a difference between the means of group A and B? So let's assume there is a difference. And specifically, let's leave group A unchanged. So we have 10 people, five scores per person, a mean of zero, and a standard deviation of one. We're gonna say that the manipulation caused a change for group B. Here again, there are 10 subjects, five scores per subject, but we're saying the mean of this distribution will be 0.25. Seeing as we're using a unit normal distribution, we're saying effectively that this group's mean is shifted up by 0.25 of a standard deviation. So now the scores are coming from different distributions. That means, presumably, that we should be able to reject the null hypothesis. It's clearly not true. These scores do come from different distributions. The difference isn't very large, mind you. It's only 0.25 of a standard deviation. We don't have that many subjects and we don't have that many scores per subject. So what will happen if we do this 1,000 times? That would be like running this experiment 1,000 times. Let's find out. We're gonna save the p-value each time and make a histogram. So here's the histogram. When you run this experiment 1,000 times, the histogram no longer appears flat more of the p-values are smaller. Specifically, in terms of p-values being less than 0.05, in this case, 20% of the p-values would be less than 0.05. All right. That's actually not very encouraging. If you knew there, if you were trying to measure um, some effect that was only this big, I was at 0.25 shift in standard deviation, you wouldn't reject the null hypothesis very often with this design. You would need to run more subjects to make it a more powerful experiment. So before we go on, I'm just going to briefly mention effect size and I'll flip over to the website here when we talk about the size of an effect, it has a regular meaning. First of all, some experimental manipulation can cause change. And you know that change it can cause could be big or it could be small. So that's what we mean by effect size in terms of just regular old words. But it also has a specific meaning in statistics uh, where for example, Cohen proposed that we could talk about effect sizes for means in terms of standard deviation units. So there's this general idea that you could talk about a difference, so D, in terms of the mean difference that you found divided by the standard deviation of that, of those distributions. I'm not going to clarify this in any further in the sense that um, we'll talk about it in other labs uh, to refine our understanding of exactly what kind of standard deviation we might want to put here. But the general idea is that, um, you know, if I found a mean difference of two, is that a big mean difference or a small mean difference? If the standard deviation of that distribution was 0.5, then a difference of two would be humongous. It would be a difference of four standard deviations. That's a huge shift. If the standard deviation was like 100, then it would be two out of a hundredth of standard deviations. 
So it'd be a very small shift in terms of standard deviations. In our simulations, we've been using unit normal distributions. And so when we explore mean differences, as we have just done, when we looked at a mean difference of 0.25, um, or we can change it, and we're going to in a moment, to 0.5 or 1 or 2, uh, seeing as we're using the unit normal dif distribution, any shift uh, can be understood in terms of standard deviation units. If group A had a mean of 0 and group B had a mean of 1, that would mean that the difference is a whole standard deviation. So a, a mean difference of 1 has uh, the same meaning as one standard deviation because we're defining our standard deviation to be of size 1. So let's take a look at power curves in terms of effect size. And our measure of effect size will be something like Cohen's d. Consider this. We're going to make a vector of effect sizes. Here it is. And we start at 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and all the way up to 1.5. So we're talking about effects that are zero, that means no difference between group A and B. This is effectively the null hypothesis. And then effects that have increasingly larger sizes in terms of standard deviation units from 0.1 standard deviations to 1 to 1.5. And we're not going to go past 1.5 in this case. These are uh, 1.5 would be really big change. Now, what we'd like to do is run 1,000 experiments for each of these different effect sizes and see if we can answer this question up here. What proportion of experiments would be significant if the effect size was 0 or 0.1 or 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.4 and so on? So to figure out the answer, we're going to run many simulations. I'm going to create a variable called prop significant, which is going to be the proportion out of a thousand that were found to reject the null hypothesis at an alpha level of 0.05. We're gonna be using basically the same code as we have before. Use our replicate function with a thousand experiments. We're going to pop in, um, 10 for the number of subjects in each group. We'll keep five as the number of scores per subject. We're sampling from a unit normal here for group A. So all of this in the t-test function is group A. And this one is for group B. And the only thing I've changed here is for each step in the loop, remember I is going to go through the values in effect sizes here. Well, it's actually going to go from one to the length of that. And I think there's, oops, how many are there in there? 16. Okay, so when i is one, we'll put a one in this thing right here. And we'll be evaluating the effect size of zero. And then when i is two, we'll be evaluating the effect size of 0.1 and so on, all the way up. Each time we'll run a thousand experiments and each time we'll do a t-test for an independent sample and we'll save the p-value. And then we'll see how many of the p-values out of a thousand are less than 0.05. So let's do these things. One, two, run the loop. And on my computer, you could see that it's going to take about 15 seconds or however long that was, it's over now. And uh, what have I done? So I should have a vector called prop significant. And these are the proportion of experiments that are significant. Remember before we were simulating the null hypothesis, asking what proportion of experiments were significant when there is no difference. And by chance alone, 5% 
of the experiments will have p less than 0 0.05. That's the definition of chance. And uh, for our first evaluation, when our effect size was set to zero, we see again, we're getting close to 0 0.05, which uh, suggests our simulation is doing something correct. I'm going to put these things into a data frame called plotdf, which just lines up my effect sizes with the proportion significant values. And then we can make a plot and look at it. So here we have a power curve. And it might be easier if I bring it down just a bit in size. So we're looking at the proportion of experiments out of a thousand in this simulation that um, provide a, uh, that reject the null hypothesis at a alpha level of 0 0.05. So the main thing to point out here is we're talking about a very specific design with n equals 10 in each group, with degrees of freedom of 18. In a design like that, um, you get a power curve like this. So for example, if it happened to be the case that in the real world, your manipulation caused a difference of a whole standard deviation, that means the effect size would be one. If the effect size is one, for real, then this experimental design with 10 in each group would almost 100% of the time reject the null hypothesis. However, let's say your experiment um, the manipulation wasn't very strong, wasn't as strong. You know, and what it does is it shifts the mean by 0.2 of a standard deviation. So it really, let's, let's just say, it really does do that. Well, if in that case, this design will only reject the null hypothesis at a rate of around 0.2 here, according to the simulation. So this would be um, a miss, most likely. If you ran this experiment, th this design to, de to detect an effect of this size, most of the time you wouldn't, quote, detect it according to um, rejecting the null at 0.05. So power curves are a property of the design, and they are useful to create when you're considering running a design because you can know in advance what your design is capable of detecting. And you can make decisions such as changing the number of subjects, changing the number of cells in your design for the number of scores per subject and things like that to uh, allow yourself a higher sensitivity, let's say, to detect um, effects of interest. We're going to be talking a lot more about power curves throughout the rest of the course, and that is the end of this section, just uh, providing an example to start getting you thinking about this. We'll do another power curve when it comes down to the generalization assignment. You should be able to use uh, this code to help you out with that.